Well, we continue in our octave of Easter. The church is so happy about the resurrection that we remember it and celebrate it for eight days. And so uh, in the, the, the prayers of the mass, the priest says, uh, in the preface, he says, on this day, as if today is still Easter Sunday. And so how beautiful and special that is. In the former versions of the calendar, uh, we had a lot more octaves, octave eight, right? So an octave is, is a continuation of a celebration for eight days. And uh, today there are drastically fewer octaves in the current calendar, but we certainly still have, have this one. And so we, we continue to celebrate Easter and remember Easter joy. And tomorrow is also a solemnity. So, uh, you know, uh, so you can have meat and all that kind of stuff. You know, you can celebrate that day. So today we uh, read from Acts of the Apostles. And uh, I am going to kind of keep an eye on the homily length for uh, the octave because I am exercising an a traditional option of, of praying the Roman canon every day of the octave, so it does add more time. So today we heard about Peter addressing the people in Solomon's portico after the cure of the crippled man that we read about in yesterday's Mass. And this is really interesting, right, uh, that, the, uh, that apparently this makes a huge impression on them, uh, that the disciples of a man who had started an upstart religious movement against the establishment had been killed, his disciples seemed to have the same unusual powers, powers as, as Jesus. And uh, Peter explains that this is no, no mere magic or, or kind of slate of hand, but that uh, these are from God and that Jesus really is the fulfillment of what was promised to Israel. And that through ignorance, through hardness of heart, all kind of different things, Jesus was crucified. But uh, God has uh, raised him from the dead. And you know that the healing of the crippled man is a sign pointing to the validity of this mission of Jesus. And so it really is a, a beautiful reading. And, and, if, and I want to go back and keep kind of diving into the fundamentals here. It's so easy for us to be inoculated against the resurrection, for us to lose the sense of wonder because, you know, you've been Catholic a long time, you know, the, the, you've been in the church a long time and you've gone through so many Easter's and it stopped impressing you. It stopped teaching you anything. And we want to change that. You know, it, uh, it says here that, that Christ is the fulfillment of everything that had been promised. And the, again, that this, this man's healing is a sign of the validity of Christ's mission. You know, the apostles could come and could have come and said, uh, "You put Jesus to death, and prepare now for uh, utter destruction, because He is alive, and He will take vengeance on those who hurt Him." And they didn't say that. If it had been just a regular kind of earthly mission, or if Jesus had been like the, the, the gods that the Romans and the Greeks worshiped, then it would have been more like that. Instead, it, what the message is, is you put Jesus to death, it is time to turn to him, to turn to the resurrected one. So we should allow that to really speak to us and strike us with the beauty and the power of this this message. Now, I want to go to the gospel very briefly. Uh, look what happens here in Luke. Jesus ministers after his resurrection to the apostles. He's ministering to 
the chosen men, in this case, the 11, after Judas defected. He's ministering not to the, the wider community of believers. He doesn't even explicitly describe an apparition to Mary, but to the chosen men. Why is this important? Because it is amazing how Protestantism has managed to completely miss the significance of the priesthood in the early church in so many ways. He goes to the men that he has chosen as the first bishops. He's not trying to get some random adherent to Christianity. He's trying to get the priest. He's trying to get them on board. And it says very clearly that, that they were receiving that grace to believe. You can't evangelize something you don't believe in. Because all of these men, the 11, would be called to go out and to bring the gospel to others. And I want to kind of end this on a kind of a random connection. I think there is a bit of connection. You know, just to realize how important the priesthood is, we pray for our priest, we pray for our bishops, we pray for our deacons. You know, and we all support each other with our vocations. And to realize that you know, I've had people come to me and say, oh, you know, my parish has an international priest and I can't understand him, you know. I don't know what he's talking about. Let me tell you something. In 10 years, there will be almost no native-born priest in your parish. There will be almost none. We're not getting vocations from the United States. We essentially don't. There are some exceptions in very localized places. Keep praying for vocations, but be great. Let's be grateful for every vocation. And I, you know, I want to be very clear that I'm so deeply grateful for the incredible men and the women in different vocations, the men that come across the ocean to serve in our country and how much they teach me and witness to me. So don't misread me here. What I'm saying is it's going to be almost completely international because we don't get vocations from the United States. So be grateful for what we have. Pray for your priests, pray for our, our leaders, and, uh, and, 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 and we work together. We work together as the body of Christ. And again, Jesus in these, these first few days after the resurrection, he's ministering to the apostles that they can go out and minister to others. And likewise, each of us in our own way, in our own little fashion, are sent to minister to the gospel.